thought of this message this morning is the four P's of greatness. P's. The four P's of greatness. The first P is pursuit. The pursuit of greatness. The second one is pain. The pain of greatness. The third one is the profit of pain in greatness. And the fourth P is passion. <clears throat> passion in greatness. Turn your Bibles, please, to Isaiah chapter 63. We're going to look at scripture that outlines the greatness of God. Isaiah chapter 63, and we'll just begin with verse 1. Who is this that cometh from Edom with dyed garments from Mazar? This that is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength. I that speak in righteousness, mighty to save is him that speaks. Now the message in the church, you know, today across the land is that, you know, God is great and he'll make you great. It almost reminds me of you know, Bill Cosby and, and himself, if you ever watch it, and, and his wife wanted him to come down and make his, his kids breakfast early in the morning. And, and he's just like, you know, why don't you do it? And, and she about kicked him out of bed. And he said, you're serious about it. You go down and make the kids breakfast. Something nutritional. And so he goes downstairs and he has no idea, right? He's a, a dad that has no clue in the kitchen what to do. And then he begins to think, okay, something nutritious. And he looks over there in the corner and he sees this big chocolate cake. And then he thinks, okay, nutrition. Chocolate cake's nutritious. Okay, you got wheat, and you know, and you got eggs and protein and the flour and the milk, and that's nutrition. And so he says, you know, what's better than that for breakfast? So he cuts his kids up a bunch of chocolate cake and he sets it down in front of him and the kids begin to eat it and the kids begin to sing, Dad is great. He gives us chocolate cake. Dad is great, you know. And, and I just think sometimes we just see God like that. God is great. He gives us chocolate cake, you know. He gives us chocolate cake and it's just the chocolate cake, you know, and bless him. God, God's great. He gives us chocolate cake. Well, yeah, me, sometimes, but not all the time. <coughs> Excuse me. You see, folks, number one, the first P of greatness is pursuit. And you see, we must be in pursuit. Hang with me. Don't throw up red flags yet or whatever until we get through with this. But we, we must be in pursuit of greatness. Pursue it. Keep your finger on Isaiah because we're coming back to it. But now turn to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. And beginning with verse 17. This is what struck me the last few days. Is my constant need, my pursuit of greatness. Now, before I read this scripture, please listen to this comment that I'm going to make. The achieving of greatness. <clears throat> okay. How do you become great? How do you know what's great is great? And there's a billion books written on how to be great, how to be successful, and all those type of things. But listen, this is what the Word of God says, and the achieving of great greatness is found in the journey of never stopping the pursuit of it. The pursuit of greatness or the achieving of greatness is found in the journey of never stopping the pursuit of it. That's great. Greatness is not a destination. Greatness is a way of travel. Greatness is the journey. It's not a last 
place where we finally end and now we declare, I'm great, or we're great until we get to heaven, then we're all great. Can you say amen? amen? But that's not what I'm talking about this morning. I'm not talking about heaven. I'm talking the pursuit thereof. And now, once again, very familiar scripture to us, but let us see it from this perspective this time. Ephesians chapter 1, beginning with verse 17. <clears throat> and he said, Paul says that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ the Father of glory may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of His calling and what the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints. And what is the exceeding greatness of His power to us word who believe according to the working of his mighty power which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places far above all principalities and powers and might and dominion and every name that is named not only in this world but also in that which is to come and have put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Can you say amen? amen? You see, folks, that's greatness. When we come to a place where our eyes of understanding are enlightened, then we are in the pursuit of greatness. <coughs> now, as I read through this scripture and as I look at it and contemplate it, I've said this to us before. I'm supposed to be an expert in God. I'm supposed to be an expert in God. I can't quote very much scripture because I've never tried to learn it. <laughs> I just go to it and find it. You know what I'm saying? I mean, some preachers will stand up here and some people can start in Genesis and go through Revelation in an hour and a half, quote every verse, every scripture. I can't do that. I can't do that. But that doesn't make one an expert in God. One that is an expert in God is one who pursues greatness according to these scriptures that my relationship in Jesus Christ would flourish and would grow and I would, my eyes of understanding would be enlightened. I would grow in wisdom and discernment so that I understand the great things of God. Now listen to this. And when I discover, further discover in my journey, the great things of God, that allows me to make earthly things work better. See, so many Christians, they, they get burned out, they get frustrated and discouraged because God doesn't answer their prayers and God doesn't do this for them and God doesn't do that. And, and, you know, and they're all wrapped up in, you know, God gives me chocolate cake. God's great, but he's supposed to give me chocolate cake. We're not understanding that it's not about Christianity. It's about a personal relationship with Christ and that as I grow in greatness of understanding, and enlightening about God. And sometimes, folks, you got to look between the lines to learn about God. Yes. There are many people that will take this book, take the Bible, and use it as a sledgehammer on other people. Yes. It's not a sledgehammer. <coughs> it's a sword. <laughs> it's a revelation. And sometimes you got to read between the lines, having discernment of the Holy Spirit, to not just read what it says in black and white, or red, black and red, but what isn't it saying? You see, folks, those are the secret places of God. Yes. And when one desires and pursues after greatness, they want to know those secrets. And they seek after those secrets. Can you say amen? Now, don't say amen here until I'm done with, with this next quick section. Okay? 
First of all, it's not wrong for one to acknowledge his pursuit of greatness. I'm saying that to you right now. I'm in pursuit of greatness. It used to be that I was in pursuit of accomplishment. Now I have to be in pursuit of greatness. Hang on to that now. Okay? So it's not wrong to acknowledge I'm in pursuit of greatness. In fact, I'm pursuing it hard right now that I might serve the Lord. And many times, folks, that entails some pain. You see, and I've been there. I've been there. Up there visiting and praying and fellowshipping with Loretta and Floyd and the, and the uh, Alfred family. Man, seeing all those tubes and everything and the hair and, and the stuff and it's just, it's just, you know, and she would kind of talk and I'd say, oh man, sister, I, I understand. Been there. Been there. I was there. And then we left her room this last time. I just looked at my wife. I said, honey, I just, I hate hospitals. I said, I hate them. I hate them. I'd whore them. I'd whore them. I don't know she made some comment. And I said, I've been there. I've been there. And I'm telling you what, I hate it. And I may have to be there again. I'll get to that in a moment. I may have to, I'm still not done with the, you know, those hospital things and, and, and tubes and wires and things connected on and running out and spewing out and leaking out. You know, there's nothing worse than, than, than the doctor tell you, you've got something, we need to leak it out. You know what I'm it's going to leak out. Okay, that, that's something you don't want to hear. And unless you've been there to where it's leaked out, it's difficult to understand the dynamic of what we're talking about. Now please listen to this. Greatness doesn't mean being the most popular. Greatness doesn't mean having the most friends. Greatness doesn't mean having the most monetary value. Greatness doesn't mean being the healthiest. However, God is great. He gets to talk to take. However, I know one person, I know a young man who was great. And he is great, and he is the most popular. This young man is great, and he is great and he has the most friends. He is great and is worth very, very much in monetary value. He is great and is the most healthiest. You see folks, I used to be there. There was a time when I was the most popular and now I'm unknown. There was a time when I had the most friends, and now I have but one. There was a time when I had a certain amount of monetary value, and now we have very little. And there was a time when I was the most healthy, and now my body is broken. You see, folks, whether you have or whether you don't have, doesn't determine greatness. Let's look at it, another couple other examples for a moment. George Soros. You all know who he is, right? He's the richest man in the world. He's anything but great. Hates America. Hates God. Hates white Christians. Hates male Christians. White male Christians. Hate us. The latest word out on the street is this, is that he is investing millions of dollars now into and in trying to groom what he thinks should be the next president of the United States. <coughs> He's a 32-year-old Muslim, born in America, educated in America as a doctor. 
32-year-old Muslim that prescribes to Islam. This year he's running for the governor of Michigan, 32 years old. George Soros and all of his billions and billions of dollars perceive that he can win in 2020 the next presidential election and the next, if not 2020, 2024, and the next president of the United States after Donald J. Trump will be the first Muslim as president of the United States of America. Now this is George Soros, who's maybe the wealthiest man in the world. Hates America, hates God, hates white Christians. Folks, I'm here to tell you, he's anything but great. Used to know a pastor years ago in Spokane. His name was Walter Pagram. Love the guy. Pastor, glad tidings of Sunday God Church in Spokane. In those days, they were kind of the thriving church. They were running 500 or whatever, very popular. Pastor Pagram was well to do by his church. I remember him telling me, Every year, there were people in his church that would buy him a brand new car every year, a town car. Every year. God is great. He gives 